Hello, this is Brother Sammy, and today we're going to be dealing with what is apparently a controversial topic for some, for there are many professing uh, believers who have conveyed openly that they have a problem with tithing under the covenant of grace. They uh, put forth an effort to try to prove that it is uh, unsubstantiated with, with, with scripture, of course. Um, if you have a belief, you see, and you claim that that belief has a biblical foundation, you must show forth verses that support that belief, those verses must say what you believe. You see, you can't read into the verse what you want the verse to say. You have to, it has to be a verse that says very clearly and very plainly uh, what you are claiming to believe. You see, and if you say that tithing is no more, that it has ceased, that it is no longer a requirement for uh, uh, the New Testament believer to observe under the covenant of grace, you must give scripture that says verbatim exactly that. You see, you can't go to verses and quote them out of context and, and read your own idea into the verses and put a, a lot of suggestions uh, into a verse. It has to say exactly what you believe in order to validate or to substantiate your claim. And this is very important, you see. And um, if one is going to argue that tithing has ceased, they must also argue that offerings have ceased of any kind, any kind of offering uh, uh, that was done under the law uh, uh, is no longer valid anymore if you're going to make the argument that tithing uh, uh, has ceased because tithing and offering falls into the classification of giving giving you see both are a form of giving and there's nothing in the New Testament that says um, or that prohibit or that gives forth evidence that offerings and tithings, uh, that is these two forms of giving, has ceased. You see, you can't make an argument saying offerings are still valid today, but tithing is no longer valid today. You can't do that, you see, because if you're going to um, uh, to write off one, you have to write off the other one because both are in the same classification. It is a form of giving, giving, you see. Whereas with the offerings, we give you know, out of our heart. Whereas with the time, uh, we learn uh, by the writings of Moses that the tithing is the Lord's. Okay, if the tithing is the Lord's, if the scriptures reveal that the tithe belongs to the Lord, at what point are there any verses in the New Testament that would support or that would say that the tithing has ceased to belong to the Lord? Are there any verses? If you can't give verses to, to validate your beliefs, then you're just arguing in circles, you see. You see, and, and you can't expect those of us who, who know the truth, who have a personal relationship with God, uh, to buy into your false notions when there is no uh, scriptural support for your position other than verses that you're taking out of context. Um, in an effort to prove your own private interpretation. Alrighty. Um, let us go over to uh, 
Psalms uh, 24. Let's go to Psalms 24, verses 1 and 2. And let's examine what is the Lord's. What belongs to God? What belongs to Him? What what does He have a right to call His own? Well, we go to the Scriptures to answer these questions. Over in Psalms chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, and it reads thus. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. It becomes apparent right here that the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's, okay, and the fullness thereof, all that it consists of, you see, internally and externally, it is the Lord's. All that it consists of, it is the Lord's, you see. The world and they, referring to all living, and they that dwell therein. In other words, God holds the title deed to all things and everything, even you and I, you see. For he hath founded it up on the sea and established it up on the floods. God founded it and God established it. And God, therefore, declares that it belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's. Nothing belongs to you. Regardless to what you may believe, no one can claim ownership of anything. Job said, naked I came into the world and naked I will leave. My friend, you own nothing. God holds the title deed to all things. You see? And so, you are a steward. You have been entrusted with the wealth of God. It all belongs to God. None of it belongs to you. The house that you live in is not yours. The cars you drive is not yours. The money in your bank account is not yours. Nothing is yours. You are simply uh, allotted uh, the privilege of being a steward over God's wealth. That simple. You own nothing. Alrighty, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Let's go over the, to Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. And we're going to see that the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. Let's go look at this over in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. And keep in mind that silver and gold is how we... Uh, we uh, put an estimate on paper money. That's how we put, uh, that's how we uh, measure the value of paper money, silver and gold. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind as we examine this passage of scripture. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 says, uh, in chapter 2 verse 8 it says, listen, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. So the silver and the gold belongs to God. Now, the question that I have in mind at this point is that if the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world is the Lord's, and they that dwell therein, the silver, the gold, the diamonds, the coal, all of the commodities that we uh, take of the resources that we take from the earth realm belongs to God and we're allowed to 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 use it uh, to benefit from it you see to be sustained by it you see if it's all God at what point does it ever cease being God's you see you see now watch this now because I'm laying a foundation for the tithe you see, I'm laying a foundation for the tithe. I 
implore you to use common sense when you read the scriptures. You see. Mm -hmm. Now this brings us to the tithe. And who does the tithe belongs to? Let's flip over to Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 and 33. Let's examine this uh, question. Who does the tithe belong to? Let's see. All righty. Verse 30 reads, And all the tithe, all, whatever it may consist of, all the tithe, of the land, rather of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. So the first part of this statement in verse 30 uh, clearly conveys that the tithe is the Lord's. And that word tithe is also translated as tenth. That's what a tithe is. It is a tenth. And here God is clearly conveying that a tenth of all of your increase, whatever that may be, it belongs to the Lord. You see, even as the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein, even as the silver and the gold is the Lord, so also the tithe is the Lord's. You see, and so let's read on. It is holy unto the Lord. It is holy. That means consecrated and set apart and designated for the Lord. It has a specific purpose. And we'll get into, the, into that purpose as we continue in this study. It has a specific purpose, you see. And it's not to be used any other way other than how God designated for it to be used. To use it any other way is to profane it, you see. It's the same thing in the New Covenant. We learn that our bodies is the temple of God and that our bodies are not our own to do as we please, but our bodies is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. And the scripture says very, very clearly, Paul is talking to New Testament believers. He says that if we uh, defile the body of God, he says such a person God will destroy. He will destroy. And this is New Covenant, my friend. So uh, let us let us take heed, you see, uh, and, 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 and acknowledge the fact that just because we're saved by grace and our salvation is not based on works, it doesn't give us the right to dismiss and disregard that which God has has set for his chosen people. You see, are you listening to me? You see. And, and even though we can't lose our salvation, you see, it doesn't mean that we are exempted from the repercussions of our error, that we will not suffer some loss in our bodies or in this life or in the life to come as it refers to the believer's reward being evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, uh, the Bible teaches that believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they will be judged according to their labor, and they will be rewarded according to their labor. And everything that falls into the classification of wood, stubble, and hay, they will receive no reward for it. But everything that falls into the classification of silver, gold, and precious stones, uh, they will be rewarded for that. You see? And though we suffer loss in that sense, the Bible clearly teaches that we will still be saved. You see, and so, so it's important to have these clarities, these this sense of balance when coming at the Word of God, when you're trying to interpret Scripture. You see, mm -hmm. all righty. When you go to verse thirty-one of Leviticus chapter twenty-seven, it says, "And if a man will at all redeem out his tithes, he shall add thereunto the fifth part thereof." Verse thirty-two. And concerning the tithe of the herb and of the flock, now watch this next statement, even of whatsoever passing under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Now, we have to understand that the writer uh, addresses the fact that tithing, uh, can your tithe can take on many different forms. 
and and he opens the door for the possibility of many things whatsoever yields the God increases you with or blesses you with did he bless you with that money did he bless you with that silver and that gold did he bless you with those finances do you give him credit for that ah so your increase would be from God you see now watch this now and concerning the tithe of the of the herb of the and of the flock even of whatsoever that word whatsoever is very important he says passing under the rod the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord whatsoever that opens the door for uh, 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 flocks uh, uh, crops uh, gold silver coin money paper money whatever whatever God blesses you with you see a tenth of it a tenth of it will pass whatsoever pass under the rod or what is approved is is a tenth holy unto the Lord are you listening to me of course we know he's talking about Moses' rod see this all this has to be approved you see you see in Moses was designated the responsibility to oversee this and to make sure and Aaron to make sure that what was being given was the best you see you see amen so the word whatsoever is connected to the tithe whatsoever you see so this argument about you know um, the tithe only took on uh, the form of crops and and livestock is it's just a rabbit trail argument uh, to to validate uh, one's tight fistedness uh, and their covetousness concerning um, God's tenth, His time. It belongs to Him, and if you refuse to release it, you are coveting God's time. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Alrighty, now. Jesus over in Matthew chapter 7 10 verse 24 through 27 uh, and also in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 22 and 21 uh, Jesus talks about paying time paying taxes excuse me about paying taxes he himself paid taxes you see um, and so in Matthew uh, 22 and 21 he says render therefore unto Caesar that is the government the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God's is it not clear uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 30 that the tithe is the Lord is it not clear that verse 32 says even of whatsoever passing under the rod the tench shall be holy unto the Lord is that not clear and I would say it's very clear. Mm -hmm. I repeat, Leviticus 27 and 30 clearly teaches that the tithe is the Lord's, then it would make sense to render unto God what is God's. You see? So this is very important to understand. Oh man. Amen. Uh, this brings us to the tithe and money. Again, we have established that whatsoever passing under the rod, you see, it shall be holy unto the Lord. It is a tenth holy unto the Lord, whatever that may be, you see. All right. Those who are opposed to tithing today make an argument that tithing never took on the form of money. They demonstrate or they demand that we show them the Bible um, show them in the Bible where the tithe took on the form of money. In other words, they say, okay, give me a verse showing me and show me where the tithe took on the form of money. Okay? Let us turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 22 and 26. And it reads in verse 22, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that uh, the field bring it forth year by year, verse 25, 23, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thou God in the place which he shall choose uh, to place his name there, there, 
the tithe of the corn and of the wine and of the oil and of the first linings of the herb and of the flocks thou shalt thou mayest learn to that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord always verse 24 and if the way be too long or if the journey be too long so that uh, so that thou art not able to carry it all in other words or if the place be too far for, 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 for from thee which the Lord uh, God shall choose to set his name there when the Lord thou God uh, hath blessed thee verse uh, 25 says then shalt thou turn it into what money then shalt thou turn it into what money money watch this now and bind up the money in thine hand and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thou God shall choose okay Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 20, 22 and 26 clearly shows that the tithe took on the form of money my question to them whose argument is that the tithe never took on the form of money of which I have uh, cleared up with Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14 uh, verse 22 and 26 my question is this number one why in the New Testament did the apostles ever preach an anti-tithing message number two question or where in the Bible does it say specifically tithing uh, should be done no more answer these two questions with New Testament scriptures that says verbatim or uh, demonstrates uh, where uh, the apostles basically uh, said to the New Testament church that they were no longer required to pay tithes and uh, also point out from the New Testament if you can uh, a verse specifically saying that tithing is no more all right if you can't answer these two questions with the Bible with Bible verses that says verbatim that tithing is ended to prove your argument to be true then my advice to you is leave God's tithers alone you see if you want to covet God's uh, tithe uh, we know that it's God's tithe because we learn uh, in uh, the writings of Moses that the tithe is the Lord's and if you want to covet his his tithe that's you but leave God's tithers alone amen if a person don't want to tithe that is fine but I advise you to be careful who you are accusing of being greedy you see as far as I'm concerned it seems the greediness is on the part of those who refuse to honor God with the tithe which belongs to God I might add you see Alrighty. How did God intended how did God intend for the tithe to be used? Let's address this question, you see. Because all this is going to be brought over into the new covenant. You see. Alrighty. Let's see how did God intend for the tithe to be used. Alrighty. Alrighty. We learn in Numbers chapter 18 verse 24 and 27 let's read but the tithe of the children of Israel which they offered as an hate offering unto the Lord I have given to the Levites to inherit now the Levites is the priesthood under the law they had the responsibility of carrying out the service of the tabernacle of the congregation which dealt with uh, uh, the sins of the people under the, under the law Israel that dealt with our sins being atoned so they did a ministry that God had designated to be done or appointed to be done so that Israel's sins could be forgiven you see they ministered to the people you see and uh, and among other responsibilities and that was their uh, service to the Lord and to the people and so the tithe that was taken from Israel was to go to the support of the Levites, the Levitical priesthood in their families. You see. So, therefore, and I read the concluding part of verse 24, therefore I have said un, unto them, that is the children of Israel, 
I mean, excuse me, the Levites, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Verse 25 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel tithes, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, you see, then ye shall offer up a have offering uh, of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of it, you see. So Aaron is instructed to tell those who are under his charge, uh, that is the priesthood, you know, the priests that are under his authority, they are to take a, the tenth, a tenth of what was given to them for their support and to support Aaron and his family. You see, to give to Aaron and his family. Amen. So, and it says in verse 27, he says, And this your have offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the thrusting fork, and as the fullness of the wine press. The priesthood was required of God to pay tithes as well in support of Aaron's high priest priestlyhood. You're seeing it right there. All righty. Okay. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 28. I read it. I read and it reads like this. Thus ye shall also offer a have offering unto the Lord of all your tithes which ye receive of the children of Israel and ye shall give thereof the Lord's have offering to Aaron the priest. See, see that right there? So we see that the, this verse clearly conveys to you and me the significance and the purpose of the tithe. Again, we cannot ignore the fact that the tithe belonged to God. And God designated the tithe, amen, of which he mandated the children of Israel to pay to be a support mechanism for the priesthood, amen, and for the high priestly ministry, you see. All righty, let's go on. But let all you, listen to this right here, listen. Though some acknowledge this fact, uh, yet they argue that the priesthood is no more. Thus we no longer have to give tithes anymore because the priesthood is no more. This is the argument that they put forth, which is a bogus argument. The whole purpose of tithing was to support the priesthood. Uh, the tithing had nothing to do with anything ceremonial in regard to representing Christ or serving as a, t a shadow and type of Christ, but was only given as a support mechanism for those that God had designated under the law to function uh, in uh a spiritual capacity. Amen. And so, uh, but let me ask two questions, you know, with that in mind, with that whole argument in mind. Let me ask two questions. Does God have ministers in place in the body of Christ? Does he have ministers in place in the body of Christ? You see. And, 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 and the second question is, and if so, how does God intend for his ministers to be supported today? How does God intend it? Now, if God had enough wisdom set up to set up a mechanism to support the ministry under the law, the priesthood under the law, how much more wise is God uh, to set up a mechanism to support uh, the uh, ministry that he has in the body of Christ for the body of Christ? You have to understand the priesthood did a service on the behalf of the children of Israel. God also has set in place the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry. And we read about that over in Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 8 through 13. You see. And if you go down to verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles, plural, and some prophets, plural, and some evangelists, plural, and some pastors, plural, and some teachers, plural, for the perfecting of the saints. So why does he give them? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry? Oh. So it's for your maturing, amen, is, is to prepare you for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
to build you up. You see, those of you in the body of Christ, this fivefold ministry was set in place, specifically for the body of Christ. You see, and it says in verse 13, till we, referring to the body of Christ, all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. They have a responsibility to teach the knowledge of the Son of God unto, the, unto a perfect man or a mature person in Christ unto the measure of the fullness of Christ. You see, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen? So, we see that uh, God has set in place a ministry in the body of Christ. How does he intend for this ministry to be supported? Okay, but well, that brings us to the new covenant, and we're going to look at this over in First uh, Corinthians chapter nine, verse one through fourteen. And it's important that we understand that we run a cross reference, that we run cross references on what the writer is saying, because there is a point of reference for everything that he's saying. And we're going to discover that 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 Paul in First Corinthians chapter nine refers to the law as a point of reference to confirm that it is the body of Christ's responsibility to support those whom God has designated, amen, to speak and to proclaim his word into their lives. You see, and we're going to see this right here from the word of God. And uh, we're going to do cross references, you see, as we examine these verse by verse approach to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Listen to what it says. Paul begins with these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ? Are not ye my work in the Lord? What is Paul saying? Why is he presenting these pointed questions? as if he's being challenged, as if his apostleship, as if his ministry in Christ is being questioned. Apparently, we have a situation here in Corinth where some individuals uh, are questioning uh, whether or not if Paul is worthy of the rights of a Christian minister. So is he worthy of their support? You see, and as we continue to read, the context is going to tell us that. Watch this now. Verse 2 says, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Paul is not bragging. Paul is simply saying that the reason why many of you have come into the faith, the reason why many of you are professing Jesus Christ as Lord, it came as a result of my ministry in Christ. It came as a result of my preaching and teaching in Christ. You came into the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ, and believed, and God sealed you with the Holy Spirit. You are my seal of apostleship. That word apostleship simply means one who is sent from God. You are the proof that I've been sent from God. You see all right, let's read on in verse 3, because this really drives the nail into the, in, 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 into the wood. Watch this now. Uh, my, my answer, or my defense, to them that do examine me is this. Now, let's hang around verse 3 for a little while. Why would he say, my answer, my answer, or my reply, come on now, that is, Paul is speaking in his own defense. Why do he need to defend himself? Apparently, uh, his, his worthiness of being supported, you see, as an apostle is apparently under attack, you see. That becomes a no-brainer, you see. Uh, it says in verse 4, it says, Have we not power, that is the right to eat and drink, you see. In other words, like, like any other minister of Christ, we, our bodies need nourishment just like everybody else's. It needs nourishment just like everybody else's. You see, this is a, a New Testament apostle 
who is speaking to a New Testament church concerning the rights of those who are ministers that God has set in the body of Christ. You see, that so into your lives spiritually. You see, he's speaking to the fact that the body has the responsibility to support uh, uh, the Christian ministers. You see. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, the taxes that we pay to our government, it uh, we set aside uh, a salary for those that we elect to represent us, whether it be city, whether it be county, whether it be state, whether it be federal. These people, are their salaries are paid by taxpayers' dollars. You see. The same principle applies to the body of Christ. The body of Christ has the responsibility to support Christian ministers. You see. Okay, let's read on. And, and we're going to see this as we continue to read. You see, watch this now. In verse uh, 5 it says, Have we not power that is the right to lead about a sister, a wife, that is a believer, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. You see, watch this now. Watch this now. And it says, Are I, listen to this, Are I, Barnabas, only, Are I, only Barnabas, I only and Barnabas, have not we power, that is a right, to forbear working. Verse 7. Who going, now watch this now, because this is an exact quote from the law. Paul is quoting from the law as a point of reference to validate his right, to validate the right of Christian ministers to be supported by the body of Christ. Even as a soldier who goes to war, for, the, for any, any government, the government is obligated to finance that soldier, that the government is obligated to take care of him and his family, or her and her family, you see. Now watch this now. And this is an exact quote from the law, and we're going to run a cross-reference, and we're going to see that. All righty. Verse 7. Who go on a warfare any time? at his own charges. Who planted a vineyard and eateth not of the flock thereof? Or who feedeth a, a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Now see, in other words, if you is tending to a flock, do you not partake of that flock? Do you not, that flock gives you milk? That flock gives you meat. That flock gives you uh, clothing. That flock, it in turn ministers back to you. You see, you're rendering a service, and at the same time, you're partaking of that service. You see, that you're rendering to that flock. Or if you go out and you plant, you know, a, a, a vineyard, don't you partake of if you plant a garden, don't you partake up? Don't you partake of your labor? You see. See, so when we're preaching and teaching the word of God, we're providing a service. We are engaging in labor. It is labor. It is laboring in Christ. It is laboring in the Lord. You see, and this is very important. Now, let's run a cross-reference. And, and, and let's, let's, let's see that this is an exact quote from the law. Now let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Now watch this now. Now in context, Deuteronomy chapter 20 is dealing with laws about military service. You see. And so Paul alludes to, and in other words, Paul goes to this as a point of reference to validate that Christian ministers have a right to be supported. You see. By the body of Christ as it was true under the law when Israel was mandated by God to support the, the Levitical priesthood. You see. All right. Mm -hmm. Verse 4 says, For the Lord your God is he 
that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Verse 5. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicated. Okay? Verse 6 says, And what man is he that planted a vineyard? See that right there? This is an exact quote from the law. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, an exact quote, you see. In other words, Paul is giving as a point of reference to validate what he's saying as being the law of God. And relative to the New Testament church. In regard or in respect to supporting Christian ministers. You see. Alrighty. Uh, uh, verse 6 says. And what man shall. What man is he that planted a vineyard. And hath not yet eaten of it. Let him also go and return unto his house. Lest. Uh, he die in battle, and another man eaten of it. Verse 7. And what man is there that shall betroth a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another take it. Now let's read again. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9. Excuse me. Um, verse 7. Paul says, who goeth a warfare any time, or what soldier ever servant, amen, who goeth to warfare at any time at his own charge? No one. You see. All right. This is the exact quote of Deuteronomy chapter 20. Come on now. Verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. Watch this now. It says, who planted a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? You see. So what 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 is what is what is my premise for for, for, for for taking you to the law? You see. My premise is so that you can do a cross reference, so that you can compare what Paul is saying here in this New Testament passage to a New Testament church. And he is speaking in regard to Christians supporting those whom God has designated as ministers in the body of Christ. He is basically pointing to the law as a point of reference to, to, to validate that it is the body of Christ's responsibility to minister to the needs of the, minister, of the ministers. And what amazes me is that you have people, I've heard people say this, I've seen people post this underneath certain videos and, and I've heard people say this uh, in person that you know that preacher can go out and he can get a job just like me and he can work and, and all that and yet you want that preacher to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning or 3 a.m. in the morning and he's got to get up and get on that mule at that 9 to 5 that job situation and you expect for him to carry that kind of burden for you and you don't want to support him financially, period. You see, you don't want to support him. You see, but you want him to, when little Bobby goes to jail and you need him to, to use his, 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 his influence as a minister to go down there and talk to the judge and, and the district attorney and all these different people that's involved in that whole process to, to try to, you know, get them to be lenient with little Bobby and, and get little Bobby off you know, uh, 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 you know, all on the basis of his word so that, you know, they would go easy on little Bobby. You expect him to go and do all that and still try to go out and do that nine to five. You see, or, or when uh, uh, someone is the family has gotten ill and, and it's 3 a.m. in the morning and, and you need him to come to the hospital and to comfort the family and to, 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 to encourage the family in this time of difficulty and so forth and everything even though he got to get up at uh, uh, 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. in the morning and still hit the mule still get on that mule or go to work that very day you still expect for him to do all that right now. I would count that as being completely inconsiderate and selfish and ungrateful you know <laughs> period 
Alrighty. I mean, you really need to think about it. You're not thinking, you see. <laughs> you know, let's read on. Glory to God in heaven. And it's simply because you're selfish and you're inconsiderate and you don't love nobody but yourself, but you want people. You're saying that, hey, you're supposed to do this, but I don't, I'm not going to compensate you for it. You're supposed to do this, even though it disrupt uh, your whole life. You still, I still expect you to go out and take care of yourself. But in the meanwhile, I need you to come over here at 3 a.m. in the morning and help us with our situation, even though I know you got to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning and go to work. Now I'm taken from your sleep. I mean, people, are we thinking here? <laughs> you know, selfish people don't think. You see, and that's the problem with selfish people. Are there selfish Christians? Apparently so. You see, all righty. Now, when we come back to First Corinthians chapter nine, uh, uh, um, and we look at verse eight, it says, "So I say these things as a man, or said not the law, the same also." So Paul is asking the question. He's saying, "Am I giving you my opinion?" And what I think? No. Paul is saying the law confirms what I'm saying. You see? The law confirms it. This is not about salvation, my friend. This is about support of ministers. That's what it's about. And that's very important for you to, to distinguish that. You see? Amen. And we're going to see how that, 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 that Paul is going to use as a point of reference how the Levitical priesthood was supported. And how that that same principle is still in place today. It has spilled over into the new covenant concerning the body of Christ. And that the body of Christ, as under the law, Israel had the responsibility. Out of all the increase that God had blessed them with, they were to support the Le Levitical priesthood. Likewise, the body of Christ is to support the ministers in the body of Christ. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. And so, uh, verse 9 says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, um, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn, Doing not God take care of the oxen? And then he said, asked another question in verse 10, Or says he is altogether for our sakes, For our sakes, no doubt, This is written, That he that plowed should plow in hope, and that he that thrust in hope should be partaker of his hope. Come on now. Are you seeing it right there? That means to thrust in hope of partaking. See that right there? Are you seeing it right there? And then it says in verse 11, it says, And if, listen to this right here. It says, And if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You see, if we, if, if, if our ministry has resulted in, in your children coming to salvation, coming into a faith and a, and a knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ, if, 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 if your faith, your walk of faith has been enhanced and enriched and your life has been blessed and your relationship with God has grown as a result of, 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 of being associated with, with a person's ministry, you see. In other words, they have sown into your life spiritually. What's the big deal if they reap your carnal things? What's the big deal, you see? What is the big deal, you see? It's no different from when you go to the doctor and he renders you a service and, 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 and you expect to see a bill. Because you know it's only right and it's only fair to compensate him for his services. You see, because that's how he make his living. He make his living in what he do. But you expect for the minister to, 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 to do everything that God requires him to do, which is also time consuming, I might add. And then you want him to go out and work nine to five, which is also time consuming. You want him to try to balance these two uh, uh, realizations, you see. In order to in order to to accommodate you, because you too tight fisted and selfish to to support them that apparently who is apparently and evidently a blessing in your life. You see, I'm trying to get you to see something. 
glory to God in heaven. So, um, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All righty. Now, let's back up to verse um, 9 again of 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 9. It says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Do not God take care of the oxen. Now, that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. So, Paul is using as a point of reference. Why is he using this as a point of reference? He is confirming that it is the body of Christ's responsibility. If a person has preached and taught and taught his word, or taught God's word in your life in such a way that your life has been blessed, guess what? You should be a blessing to that person. You should support that person. You should help that person. The body of Christ has a responsibility to compensate. Amen. Those whom, whom Christ has appointed, amen, uh, to, to, to their edification, according to Ephesians chapter 10, chapter 4, excuse me, it talks about how that this fivefold ministry is set into the body of Christ for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and so forth and everything. That's why these ministries are set in there for you, you see. All righty. Now, if we're going to flip over and we're going to do a cross-reference between 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 9. Watch this now. See, so you have to understand that the law provides some eternal, ageless principles that are always relevant. They, they will, they, they, they will always be relative, especially in this age in which we live in today, until Jesus come again. Uh, the law provides some eternal, relative principles that we are not to neglect. You see, tithing again was never ceremonial, and that's very important to understand. You see. Are you listening to me? When you studied the epistles of Paul in Galatians chapter 2, uh, around about 6, uh, verses 14 through 17, you learn what is ceremonial. Tithing is not mentioning mentioned in that, you see. And that's very important to understand. All righty. All righty. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18. Now listen to what it says now. Let's back up to verse 17. It says, Let an elder that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now watch what it says. We see again a reference to uh, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. This, this is talking about, the, the, Paul is writing here to Timothy concerning Christians on earth. He's not talking about when we get to heaven and get a reward. He's talking about the fact that if these guys put the time in and you blessed as a result of it, you should support them. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. You see, and, 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 and if a man has a congregation of if God has blessed him with a congregation of a uh, of a hundred thousand people, well then expect for him to uh, 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 you know his, his 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 expect for his living to be somewhat different from a man who has been blessed with a congregation of ten thousand or five thousand or two hundred. You see, you can expect his living to be different. You see, you see because there's more people supporting him. Are you listening to me? You see, as a body, they can afford to do more for their uh, spiritual leader because they are more. You see, don't be jealous. You see, stop that jealousy because that's all it is. It's just jealous. <laughs> that's all it is. All right. Man, because you ain't got it. And that's what it all boils down to. I'm just going to cut to the chase and just hit it right on the, hit the nail right on the head. You jealous. You jealous. That's all it is. All right. Amen. Oh, uh, okay. Now, now again, let's go down to verse uh, First Corinthians chapter nine, verse uh, twelve. Watch what it says in verse twelve. First Corinthians chapter nine. It says, "If others be partakers of this power that is right over you, 
Are not we rather do in other words, do not we yet more? See that right there? Nevertheless, watch this word nevertheless. We have not used this power, that is this right, but suffered all things, least we should hinder the gospel of Christ. In other words, you remember what it said in verse three where he says, My answer to them that do examine me. Paul is saying, Hey, if you guys don't want to support me, if you guys don't want to minister to my needs, if you want to question my apostleship, if it's going to somehow uh, hinder you in the gospel, in your development, in the knowledge of his son and so forth and everything, you know what? I would rather not take anything from you if that be the case. You see, I would rather not receive anything from you. You see, but you got to understand that every believer don't have that issue. They don't have that. That's not an issue with every believer. Some believers, you ain't got to you ain't got to ask them. They already know what the scriptures teach, and they comply with it. And 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 their compliance with that is because number one, they love God, and they love uh, their neighbor as they would love themselves, and they especially love those who whom God is using to sow into their lives spiritually. You see, a grateful person, you don't have to ask them for nothing. You see, a grateful person, when you sow into their lives, whether it be material things, whether it be material wealth, whether it be spiritual blessings, when you sow into their lives, they just automatically, uh, in return, do something to let you know I appreciate it. Thank you. I want to support you too. You see, that's a grateful person. But an ungrateful person will take, 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 and take. And never give, and very seldom would they even say thank you. You see, and that's what we're dealing with right here with these folks who got a problem with tithing. All righty. Again, I, I pose the two questions. Again, let me let me pose these two questions again. All righty. Were in the New Testament, were the apostles. Were they ever taught an anti-tithing message? Number two. Where in the New Testament where it says that tithing is done away with? If you can't answer those questions, you need to leave this subject alone. Period. And I'm not talking about running from one verse to another verse, quoting verses out of context into and putting them into a pretext, using them as a, as a, as a coat hanger to, to support your own private interpretation. That's not what I'm talking about. The verses need to say that. They need to say that tithing has ceased. If it don't say that, then hush. You see. You see. And move on. All righty. All righty. Let's look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 13 says, do ye not know that they which minister about the holy things lived of the things of the temple? What is he talking about? He's talking about the Levitical priesthood. They lived of the holy things that were brought to the temple. The things that were required of Israel to bring to the temple, it became a support to them who did the service of the temple. And everything they did was on the behalf of the children of Israel. You see. All righty. He says, and they which wait as the altar are partakers with the altar. And if you flip over to Leviticus chapter 6, uh, verse 16, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 16, all you got to do is get your good cross reference by And you will see that Paul uses the old covenant priesthood and the support mechanism that God set in place to support the priesthood. Paul is using it as a point of reference to support uh, that it is the responsibility of the body of Christ to support their Christian ministers. Whoever that may be in your life, you have that responsibility to support those individuals. Amen. So in Leviticus chapter, if we compare Amen. Leviticus chapter 6. Let's see. Um, verse 16. Listen to what it says. And 
the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread. Shall he shall it be eaten in the holy place and in the courts of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall eat. This is talking about a provision for Aaron and uh uh, and his sons, the Levitical priesthood. You see, God's ministry under the law. This is talking about how that that the tithe, and we know that the tithe was, we've already looked at scriptures to show very clearly that the tithe, uh, God designated it to be a, a support for the priesthood. It was to go to the priesthood for their support. Period. You see. And, 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 and again, uh, uh, to those that would argue that uh, that the tithe took on the form of, of, of livestock and crops and so forth and everything. Again, I give you uh, Leviticus chapter 27, read verses 30 through 33, but pay attention especially to verse 33. It says, even the latter part of verse 33 says, even of whatsoever even of whatsoever passing under the rod, that is the rod of Moses, the rod of Aaron. Watch this now. The tenth shall be unto the Lord. Whatsoever. You see, God not only blessed them with crops and livestock, but he blessed them in business. He blessed them with silver and gold. He blessed them with in all the commodities of the earth that 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 was available to them God caused them to be prosperous in all things they had a, a, a currency they had money and say so whatsoever pass under the rod whatever takes on the form of a tenth and that's what a tithe is you see amen so let us employ common sense and stop arguing in circles you know making foolish arguments such as you know the tithe never took on the form of money and and so therefore you know you know you know you know, therefore, we today, you know, we, 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 we go out and we work on a job and we get paid with money so we don't have to pay tithes because we get paper money. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't have to pay paper money. People, use common sense. <laughs> use common sense, apparently. You know, that whole argument is just foolishness. It doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's a rabbit trail argument. To cover up the fact that you can't give one verse of scripture, not one, in the New Testament that says specifically that the tithing is no more. You can't give one verse that says specifically what the apostles ever taught an anti-tithing message. You can't answer it. There's no verse to support it. It's not fair. That's why you can't give it. You see. Alrighty. Glory to God in heaven. Praise the Lord. All righty. And so, again, Leviticus chapter 6 and 17, we see that this is concerning the priesthood and how they would be supported. Again, I, re I read verse Leviticus 6 and, se uh, six and um, 16. It says, And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat, and the unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place. Notice the term holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall eat. Okay, let's read again Leviticus, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and uh, verse 13. Do ye not know that they which ministered about holy things lived of the things of the temple? That's how they lived, you see. Uh, 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 lived of the things of the temple. And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. You can also read Deuteronomy chapter uh, 10 verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 1. Paul is alluding to the old covenant. He is referring back to the support mechanism that God set in place to support the priesthood. Amen. Showing how that same mechanism that God set in place to support his ministry under the priesthood or his ministers under the priesthood has spilled over into the new covenant amen and serve as the same basis to validate that it is the it is the body of Christ's responsibility to support Christian ministers you see to support Christian ministers we know that the building is not 
the church. We're not foolish enough to think that it is. We know that the building is the body of Christ. But this work has to be facilitated. You see. When you guys meet together and have your Bible studies, is it not in a home? You're facilitating that Bible study. You see. You know, and, and it would be wise and, and generous of you to at least, you know, give something in support of those who allow you to come into their homes and to buy and, and, and to use their homes in that in that in that respect. Though they may not require anything of you, you should offer something toward, you know, uh uh their financial encumbrance. Because they either have a mortgage or they, they are paying rent or they paying electricity. Uh, they're, they're spending money in some capacity to accommodate you in that respect. You should contribute some kind of way, not just be selfish and inconsiderate and thoughtful in, and thoughtless of that. Come on now. You see? Amen. Let's go on. Now, watch this now. Uh, uh, verse 14 is very important. Watch this now. Even so, had the Lord ordained, the Lord ordained, even so had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. They which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Let me let me break it down for you. Let me put it in simple terms for you. A doctor is supported by his doctor skills. His patients pay him. They support his medical practice. Okay. A lawyer is supported by his lawyer skills. You see, his clients, those that he represents, they compensate him for his services. When you hire an elect electrician, you expect uh, to receive a bill, and rightly so, for as the scripture says, Jesus said that a laborer is worthy of his hire, and he should be compensated for his services. You see, you see, in 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 also. Likewise, a plumber. He get paid for, for his plumbing skill. They that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, this is the way God ordained it, you see. But because of so many people who are selfish and inconsiderate and refuse to comply with the word of God in this respect, many of us have to go and work nine to fives and we have to spread ourselves out like peanut butter in order to accommodate uh, uh, the demands that 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 so many within the body of Christ puts on us, but yet they don't want they don't want to donate nothing to the cause. They don't want to donate nothing to the cause. You see, you see, this is this is sheer madness. You see, and so when we go on, let's read a little bit more. Let's read a little bit more. Watch what Paul says in verse fifteen. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things. That it should be done, uh, uh, done unto me, for it is better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in vain. In other words, what Paul is saying is right here. You know, if somehow you are going to criticize me, you see, and and talk down on me because you know I receive support from you, and you got a problem with that, he says I would rather die than to receive anything from such a person. You see, you know, in such cases, when I'm dealing with such people, you know, I, I don't take nothing from them. Uh, I don't I don't expect nothing from them. If they don't give me nothing, that's fine. What I do, I just do it anyhow. You see, and if they blessed as a result of it, that's fine and done it with me. But if they don't give anything in return, if they don't show no kind of appreciation or support. Amen. Uh, or show some kind of gratitude for the time that has been taken out of my schedule. As Paul is putting it uh, in order to minister to them on a spiritual level, that's on them if they don't appreciate it. You see. Now, watch this now. Let's go on in verse uh, 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid up on me. What is he talking about? Necessity is laid up on me. So, you can't be so foolish to think that God is going to cause food to fall out of the sky. To minister to the needs of those that he have called, especially those that he have called to full time ministry, and you just so happen to be uh, fortunate uh, to be connected with that full time ministry, to where you're reaping spiritually, you're being blessed spiritually as a result of it, 
and you and and you think it's a big deal to support such people with your with your carnal things? Far be it. You see. So Paul is saying necessity is laid upon me. Yeah, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. In other words, I'm going to preach it anyhow. Whether you give me a dime or whether you don't give me anything, I'm going to preach it anyhow. You see, whether God supports me through you or somebody else, it doesn't matter. God is going to support me because there are some that do have this understanding. This is what Paul is saying. You see, and if you flip over to, uh, let's go over to Philippians. Uh, let's go over to Philippians right quick and let's examine a, a portion of scripture that is always taken out of context. It is generalized, and this portion of scripture must be read in context if you if you're going to align yourself with this kind of blessing. You see, you see, just quoting Philippians chapter nine verse nineteen. Watch this. This is what people quote all the time, and they quote it in a general sense, not really taking into account the context. It says, "But my God shall supply your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus," and they run with it right there. But you have to, number one, ask yourself this question. To whom is Paul talking to, you see? And we see that this is an epistle to who? The Philippian believers. And why is he saying this to the Philippian believers? What is it that they have done that would cause him to say such a thing to them? To give them the, this kind of assurance that God's going to supply their every need. Okay, let's bag up to verse 15. Watch this now. Matter of fact, let's bag up to... Uh, um, uh, verse 14, he says, Notwithstanding ye, Philippians, have well done that ye did communicate to my afflictions. Ye did communicate to my afflictions, my infirmities, my wants, you see, my necessities. Okay. Ye did communicate, that means to share, come on now, to support, you see. And then it's verse 15, he says, now ye know, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church, referring to uh, the body as a whole, no church communicated, communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. See, God, whether you want to support God's ministers or not, that's, that's you voting out your financial blessing, you see. So you have to understand that there's a blessing that is associated with you believing on Jesus and as a result of it, you receive that blessing of salvation. And then there's a blessing that is associated with your finances, you see, which is connected to the principle of tithe, you see. Tithing was 400, about 500 and some years before the law was ever given. Intuitively, Abraham knew that it was right to tithe. You see, it was never given as a commandment in his initial uh, appropriation with Abraham first appropriate in relationship to Melchizedek, whom Christ has a ministry after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek received tithes. And Christ is presently our high priest today. And even as, as God designated under the law that that the tithe was to be given to the Levitical priesthood, that is that aspect of God's ministers that he set in place to minister on the behalf of the children of Israel. Likewise, the body of Christ has the responsibility to support, amen, that same mechanism is in place, and the body of Christ has a, has, has a responsibility to, to, to support uh, God's ministers today. You see, and this all is connected to the tithe. You see, when Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, Melchizedek ate and he drank and he enjoyed that uh, for himself. You see, are you listening to me? And Christ has a ministry after the order of Melchizedek. That means that what was done in relationship between Abraham and Melchizedek has continued over into the New Testament, into the law, into the also into the New Testament, you see, because Christ is presently a, a high priest. He hadn't ceased to be a high priest, and it's after the order of Melchizedek. All right, Philippians chapter um, 
For, again, verse 16 says, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessities. My necessities? Come on now. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Fruit that may abound to your account? Come on now. Verse 18 says, But I have all and abound. I am full having received. Come on now. Come on now. And the messenger that was sent from the Philippians uh, with these uh, accommodations, these, uh, these uh, items that Paul needed, uh, Paul says, you know, my all of my needs is met because of your generosity. Mm -hmm. um, um, the things which were sent from you, he says, an odor of a sweet smell and sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And then he tells the Philippians in verse 9, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, God has seen your giving, he has seen your support, and he is going, it is not going to go unrewarded, you see. And this is not, verse 19 is not to be taken in a general sense. If you're not walking in, in this truth, if you're not understanding that you have a responsibility uh, in the sight of God, and you've been mandated by God to, to support those who, who are sowing into your life spiritually, then guess what? I'm not talking about pennies and dimes and quarters and nickels. You do what you can, of course, but we know that we can all do better than penny dimes, quarters, and nickels. You see. I mean, let's be realistic here, people. <laughs> Amen. So watch this now. And in, in, uh, there's a he assure you that God will supply your needs when you do this. This is the word of God. God will supply your needs. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, he will do it. When you're walking in this kind of love, you see. See, this is love. You can talk love all you want to, but this is love. See, this is what love is right here. At work, if you ain't walking in this, you ain't walking in love. you just talking, you see. And I'm trying to help somebody. And, uh, all righty. So when you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and you come back down to verse uh, 16. It says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yet woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 17. For if I do this willingly, I, am, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. That's what that means. I have a stewardship entrusted to me. In other words, Paul is saying, God has made me a steward of this word of reconciliation, and I have a responsibility to distribute it, to disperse it. Whether you support me or not, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I still have to preach it, you see. I still got to tell it, you see. You see. But it's to your advantage if you do support me. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about your ministers, your Christian ministers. Amen. Glory to God. See, I'm not, as Paul said, I may not be an apostle to everyone, meaning one who is sent from God to speak on the behalf of God, a messenger of God, apostle, but I am to you. So God has people that he has uh, 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 appointed to, to be connected with my ministry. And as a result of my ministry, they're being blessed. And a lot of people are being blessed by my ministry and ain't giving me a dime. And I ain't asking them for a dime. Some of them step up to the plate and they take the initiative and, and support my ministry. And as Paul didn't turn away the Philippians, I don't turn away them. It's just that simple. You see. Glory to God in heaven. Glory to God. And some of them even tithe uh, into my ministry without me even asking them. You see, amen, glory to God in heaven, so there you have it, you see, and so uh, let's go on to verse um, uh, 18, it says, what is my reward then, verily that when I preach the gospel, I 
may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power, that means so as not to use to a full, uh, excuse me, that means to, so as not to use to the full of my right, in other words, in the gospel, you see. In other words, we don't charge anything for this, but you ought to have common sense. It brings you back to what Paul said in verse 7, in verse, uh, verse 7, who going to war, who going, who going to a warfare at any time at his own charge? Who planted a vineyard and eat it not the fruit thereof? Or who find it, who feeding a flock and eat it not the milk of the flock? Nobody does. You see. <laughs> Glory to God in heaven. And then he says in verses uh, 9, he says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn. Do not God take care of the oxen? Verse 10. Or saith he all together for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that plow should plow in hope, and that he that thrust in hope should be partaker of his hope. Come on now. That is to thrust in hoping of partaking. You see. I mean, you, if you go out there and do a job, you expect to be compensated. You hoping to receive some kind of uh, recompense for your labor, you see, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, whatever it, you may, what, just something you're expecting to receive something. You see, okay, keep that in mind when you read verses uh, 15, 16, and 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You have to read all in context, you see. And remember, Paul is being examined here by some, and he is questioning. He is standing, uh, he is speaking in his defense because they question whether or not if his ministry is authentic and that it should be supported by them. You see, you see that in verse 3. You see, you see where Paul puts forth that question to them that examine him. So that's what this is all about. All righty. So we see that Paul alludes to the law in reference to the priesthood to validate and to support that tithing which was given to the priesthood under the law, uh, is also a, ha, has come over into the New Testament. Amen. In other words, that mechanism that God set in place to support the priesthood under the law is still valid today. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about supporting uh, the ministries that God has set in our lives. That's what we're talking about. And if some guy who calls himself a ministry of Christ refuses to to exercise this right, well, that's his prerogative. But he has a right, you see, a God-given right to be supported by his God-given vocation. There it is, verse 13, 14, 1 Corinthians 9 and 14. So, even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. This is the word. And if you fail to see that it is to his advantage, and not only to his advantage, but as Paul said to the Philippians, I desire, watch this now, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 17, not because I desire a gift of you, you see, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. See, if he's a good minister of Christ, and, and you want to support him, he shouldn't turn it away. Because in, in supporting him, He's, you're setting yourself up to have all your needs met in Christ Jesus. That's the context right there when you look at Philippians chapter 4, beginning around the 15th verse, uh, the 14th verse, and read down to the 19th verse. That's the context right there. It's very plain when you read the context, you see. So, I hope that this was clear enough for you to understand. And those of you who are tithing, continue to tithe. Uh, in obedience to God's word. And uh, God will continue to bless your finances. Amen. Uh, and, and just don't allow anybody to deter you from the truth. I don't care how many scriptures they take out of context, they quote out of context. They are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Bless you and have a nice day.
and God bless you.